Thanks, everybody. It's great to be here with you all. Okay, so at this point in history, I no longer need to spend much time talking about the negative effects of big social platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. I don't need to convince you, I suspect. Uh, many now understand how these systems and their designs have threatened the democratic process, enabling all kinds of election interference and producing a new rise in polarizing speech, how they damage mental health from teen self-esteem on Instagram to TikTok addiction to pandemic era doom scrolling, and that big social media's structures and designs have created a fruitful path for the rampant spread of mis- and disinformation, become a meeting place for budding white supremacists, and an organizing infrastructure for various anti-democratic actions such as uh, the US Capitol riots in 2021. And one of the primary reasons so many of these problems emerge over and over again is because big social platforms are engineered to produce one thing above all else, engagement. And this is because the more we engage, the more they grow. And the more they grow, the more profit they make. More, more, more. And to induce our engagement, they use tactics like visible metrics that count our likes and follows and everything else to keep us posting and following. Algorithmic feeds that profile our wants and desires using what they learn to keep us scrolling and clicking and personalized notifications designed to pull us back anytime we step away. And so in my work as an artist and a scholar, I focus on the cultural, social, and political effects of software, making software art to ask questions about what software does, who it works for, and who it makes most vulnerable. And while I make work in a variety of media, from web browser extensions to AI-controlled robotics to computationally produced video and sound and multidisciplinary installation works. Uh, what I want to focus on today are a selection of my projects from the last several years that illustrate a variety of techniques for platform resistance, asking and acting on questions such as how is an interface that foregrounds our friend count changing conceptions of friendship? Why do we so often find ourselves stuck in the scroll? unable to disrupt our own behavior? And who most benefits when a software system can intuit how we feel? And to examine these types of questions, I use tactics such as software recomposition, data obfuscation, interface reduction, and radical reimagination. And the truth is a number of the projects I'm going to talk about cross several of these categories, so I'll jump around a bit, um, showing how art can help us better understand what the designs of big social does to us and how we might regain some agency back. And I'll end with my latest project, which reimagines the foundational design of social platforms altogether. So I want to start with a screenshot of my Facebook newsfeed. This is from about a decade ago. And here I've circled all of the metrics in red. These are the numbers that count likes, shares, comments, notifications, how many seconds ago something happened, how many birthdays you're supposed to respond to today, how many events you're, you might be missing right now, um, how many comments there are, et cetera. And as a user of Facebook back in 2011, I found myself becoming increasingly aware of just how much attention I was paying to these numbers. And I wondered how they might be leading myself and others to act in certain ways. For example, when I'm constantly told how many friends I have and how many friends my friends have, does this encourage me to forever add more friends? When I'm told that 17,772 people like this ad from appycouple.com before I ever saw it, how does that affect the likelihood that I will also like it? And when I'm shown how many likes my last status got, how does that start to guide what I write for my next post? And I've done some theoretical thinking and writing about these questions, drawing on scholars like Mark Fisher, <coughs> Matthew Fuller, Wendy Chun, theorizing about what I call the desire for more. 
And this concept starts with our evolutionarily developed need for esteem. Uh, to survive as a species, we evolved with a need to feel valued, whether it's respect from others or confidence in ourselves. Uh, and this has worked out really well for almost all of human history. But this need now plays out in the context of capitalism, where value is quantifiable and growth is a constant requirement for success. And so the result of this intersection, what I call the desire for more, is particularly activated by the designs of social media interfaces that constantly report back to us measurements of how much we are valued. So when we post something on a social media platform and it gets 10 likes, okay, but I'd really rather have 11 and 12. If I have 100 followers on Twitter, okay, but maybe I'd really rather have 200. Once I have 200, I want 300 or 400, etc. And so this gives you a little bit of background uh, on my theoretical thinking on this. And I have a paper you can read if, if you want to dig into it. Uh, but as an artist, before I did any of this theoretical work, I began my investigations by making something. And that led me to make this work that I call Facebook Demetricator. Uh, released in 2012, it's a free and open source browser extension that hides all quantifications on the Facebook interface allowing anyone to experience for themselves what the effects of these numbers might be. On the left, you can see a typical like, share, comment box, and on the right is what it looks like with Demetricator installed. You can see that people liked it, that it was shared, that there are comments, uh, but no longer is the focus on how much people like our status or how many comments we got, but hopefully on who liked it and what was said about it. I'm no longer encouraged to compare uh, when it comes to my friends, I can see that my friends have friends and that I have mutual friends with my friends, but it's not putting that number in front of me. And I can decide for myself if an ad is of interest without being told of its interest to someone else. And so with this work, I'm recomposing the Facebook interface, in this case, hiding the metrics, in order to investigate how metrics construct us as users. And I can say, that feedback from users over the last 10 years, uh, which I get a lot of, reveals uh, that visible metrics make us competitive, compulsive, and anxious. Uh, they influence what people post, what they like, who they follow, often without us realizing it. In the years since I first released that for Facebook, um, I've gone on to make it for a number of other platforms. Um, the one that I'm showing at uh, Axioma is Twitter, Demetricator. I also had one for Instagram. Um, and I guess I should pause for a second here because, of course, now this concept is somewhat known, um, this idea of hiding metrics. Uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, head of Instagram came out and said, I have an idea. Um, maybe, what, maybe we should experiment with the idea of hiding some of the numbers, because maybe it turns out they aren't that great. Um, and then they proceeded over the next two years to experiment and test. Um, and then only when a lot of uh, attack or concern was coming from the U.S. government about the leaked launch of Instagram Kids did they finally come out and say, oh, you know what, we're going to turn this on now. We're going to let you do this. Of course, it's not the default. Numbers are still on by default, and you have to click through many things, and you can't hide all of the numbers. But some of this has now been taken up um, in the last couple of years. Uh, in the meantime, in the middle of their test was the second time that Facebook came after me legally for my work uh, for, for doing this and got kicked off of various uh, distribution platforms. 2016 was the first time. So they aren't really that interested in hiding the numbers because the numbers keep you posting. Um, but if you're interested, try it out. Another beginner face change that happened shortly before the Trump election in, in 2016 was the introduction of Facebook reactions. These are the additions to the like button that brought us wow, angry, haha, -ha, sad, love, etc. And the idea as represented by Mark Zuckerberg was to give you better options for expressing yourself, to make it easier for a user to indicate how they felt about any particular post. And while reactions may help your friends better understand how you feel, it also begins to build, over time, a more detailed profile about a user's emotional life on Facebook. I have a bar graph here, but it's, it's not just a tracking, it, 
it's not just a tracking of relative emotional affect, it's a multidimensional picture of how one feels about specific types of content that they encounter. Uh, so it's emotions in context. But as is always the case on Facebook, uh, especially when they add a new feature that generates new data, it's important to think about where that data might go and who it most benefits. And when it comes to Facebook and emotions, we certainly have reason to be suspicious. Um, in 2014, uh, it came out uh, that Facebook had been intentionally manipulating the news feeds of various users in order to ascertain how well they could influence the emotional uh, response of those users. Um, they were surprised that people were unhappy about this idea when they published the paper about it. And we're still talking about in the United States, perhaps elsewhere, um, about the way that uh, Cambridge Analytica um, at least attempted to use psychographic profiling of Facebook data to segment U.S. voters for the purposes of targeted messaging. In fact, Mark Zuckerberg, a uh, suit was just filed against Mark Zuckerberg personally by the Attorney General in Washington, D.C. just a couple of days ago for his involvement in this very specific thing and the, the data leaks that happened as a result. And so Facebook reactions uh, help Facebook engage in a type of emotional surveillance. And it's emotional surveillance for the purposes of codifying each Facebook user's political and consumer identity to figure out, in the words of Cambridge Analytica's CEO, our hopes and fears. And so my response to this, which I launched in early 2017, was a work I call Go Rando. Go Rando is a web browser extension that obfuscates one's feelings on Facebook. Every time a user clicks like, Go Rando intercepts that click and instead randomly chooses one of the seven reactions for them. So you click like and you might get love. Click like, you might get haha. Click like, you might get like. But the idea is that over time, a user will appear to Facebook's algorithms as someone whose feelings are perfectly balanced, as someone who feels angry exactly as much as they feel haha, or sad exactly as much as they feel love. And you can still choose a specific reaction if you want to, it doesn't break that functionality. Uh, but even when you do, that choice will be obscured by an emotion profile increasingly filled with noise. In other words, Facebook and everyone else who gets access to that data won't know if a reaction was genuine or not. So it injects noise into the system. It obfuscates how you feel. But of course, it doesn't just obfuscate your feelings for Facebook, it also does so for your friends. Um, maybe your friend posts about a new job, you click like and it says angry. Or maybe a colleague posts about having fractured her arm that day, you click like and instead it says ha ha. And this moment is a, is a strange moment in social media where all of a sudden it makes somebody ask why. Like, why did you react that way? And these incongruencies are an intentional part of the design, um, helping to create conversation and a broader sense and forcing a previously invisible aspect of the system uh, of the interface into the foreground, which is that we're all reporting how we feel all the time. In fact, I should even say that as the person who made Go Rando and was very public when it first came out, um, that I was using it and what it does, and, and then of course I used it for the next year or so, people would even wonder why, why did Ben react? Why, why are you angry about this thing that I posted? Um, it's so strange to, to see that, that reaction that, that you can't figure out why it's there. So I want to jump now to the summer of 2018. Uh, by this point, Cambridge Analytica has reached the public consciousness and we're hearing daily about continued attempts by Russia to influence in the upcoming midterm election in the United States. And as someone who recomposes software, this all made me wonder, what would it take to make Facebook safe? Is there something I could do? I'd already hidden the metrics, I'd obfuscated emotions, there's other things I haven't talked to you about here today that I've messed with Facebook with. Um, but given that it was still a primary vector for disinformation as an artist, I wondered, what could I do? And this led me to release a work just after Labor Day in 2018, which is right before the 
last push for the election called SafeBook. SafeBook is Facebook without any of the content at all. No images, no text, no video, no audio, just the empty containers left behind after the content is removed. And it's a painstaking removal meant to hide not just the images and the text, but to do so in a way that leaves behind all the other interface interactions. The rollover effects, pop-ups, et cetera. In fact, Facebook is fully usable with SafeBook running. You can post status updates. You can leave comments. You can search. You can watch movies. You can't see them or hear them, but you get the idea. And obviously, as with some of my other works, um, this reductive interface isn't necessarily a great solution, uh, but it does draw attention not only to the challenge of making Facebook safe, uh, given that it's an algorithmic walled garden that most of us are tied into in some way at this point, but also to how homogenizing its aesthetics are and to how familiar with this interface we've become. I can easily navigate Facebook with SafeBook installed. Um, I've posted some pretty well metrically responded to posts, in fact, while, while using it. So I don't always go digging in software. And in 2019, I realized I wanted to take a step back uh, and think more about those who engineer software in order to better understand how it comes to be the way it is in the first place. And that led me to focus on Mark Zuckerberg as a quintessential CEO in Silicon Valley. Uh, using every one of his publicly available video recorded appearances in archive, I decided to extract every time he spoke one of three things, the word more, the word grow or growth, and every time he uttered a number, a metric, like one million or two billion. And I used this to create a video supercut that chronicles Silicon Valley's obsessions with growth over the last 15 years, over the first 15 years of Facebook. And when I started working on this project, I thought, you know, this is going to add up to a long supercut. Um, five minutes, eight minutes, ten minutes. Nobody's going to want to watch eight, ten minutes of Mark Zuckerberg saying the word more. Um, but I wanted to, and I'm an artist, so I get to do that. So I went ahead and made it anyway. And I started building the archive and extracting uh, all these words that he had spoken. And it got to five minutes, and it got to eight and ten minutes, and I wasn't anywhere near done. And I kept going, it got to 15, 20. By the time I was done, it was almost 50 minutes long of nothing but the word more grow in numbers. And I think the scale of the project is fitting to its subject. So because it's a 47 minute uh, video, if you wanna watch the whole thing, you should come to Oxioma um, and see the show. But for us today, I've made a, a f about a four and a half minute uh, shortcut of it, um, so it's about 10% of, of the total. And I should say that it starts when Mark is age 19 in 2004, his very first appearance uh, when Facebook was first launched, and it ends at the end of 2018 after he's just gone in front of, had you know, been called in front of the U.S. Congress, in front of the European Parliament for the Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, and it's in chronological order, so you see him grow and you see technology change and so it starts off with really kind of um, old junky internet video and ends up with nice slick spots on CNN and that kind of a thing. Many more 400, 500, 100,000 for 100 or 200. To grow it, therefore it would grow. Thousands. I mean, there doesn't necessarily have to be more. Almost a million. More focused on growing really quickly. More than 40%. More than a third of a few thousand more schools. I think I have like 15,000 pending friend requests. More than a few thousand, 100 or 200. The 100 or 200, 6 million, 6 million, 100 million, 100 billion of more. Hundreds of thousands, it's more, it's much more. Sharing more information, taper the growth, more of it, more engaging, and that users trust more are going to be the ones that spread through the system more. They're going to get more, more, a, a, a lot more, become more open, share more, make themselves more open and share more. More than 70 million, maybe a few thousand speak more. Just grew so quickly and there's more of it. A lot more, a lot more, a lot more, some more. Fastest growing hundreds of millions is more, a lot more, a lot more, 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 50%, more, more than 500 million, more than 50%. And now it's, it's growing. Was more, make them more, much more engaging and three quarters of a billion for almost half a billion, multiple billions of be more, a lot more and more and more, more tens of millions of tens of millions of more, more that are more, more than a million 
right? More than a million, um, 10,000, tens of thousands for one more. Much more, a lot more, an order of magnitude more. It's more than 200 million billion. The growth more and access to more. And I'm so much more, half a billion more, probably a lot more, would grow more and more, sharing more and more, sharing more and more. And billions, a trillion or more, thousands of more than a trillion. There's a lot more, to more, one more, 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 a billion, 500 million, half a billion, or more, more, more efficient, more. The first billion, way more, six billion, 11 million, 5 billion, 11 million, kept on growing to the next billion more. You know, a billion isn't like a magical number. 5 billion, billions, 699 million, more than 40% of more competition, on more, it's more. It's around 20% in the, and, um, and we're, we're growing more, engaging more, sharing more. What's more likely is that almost a billion grow and more than 100,000 on grow, you know, I mean, grow, growing really quickly, more human, growing more stuff of more than one to get more. There are thousands at 100%. People want more, more valuable. We've been pushing just to get more thousand, 100 million, 9,000, 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000 or 8,000, 1,000, right? It's, it's 9,000 or 10 million or 100 million or more. It's actually growing really slowly. It's growing, it's not growing at a fast rate. Five billion, one and a half billion, five billion, it's about 2,600, right? 1,500 is the data. Focus on the first billion. You know, the, the first billion, way more, continue growing. And more data, more, but also more, more money, and more profitable, and then a lot of more, a lot more, multiple times more, more things. More profit gets more, do more, 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 more things, more, 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 get more, 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 100 or more, a billion or more. Gross more has grown to grow and grow. It's growing more data, I think. Do more to grow more, more, accelerate the growth of tens of billions, a lot of more, more tools, more, more tools. It grows, it grows even more profitable and grows even more. 250 million, more to a billion, community of a billion. A, a billion's kind of an arbitrary number. Uh, it's a nice round number, but it's a little arbitrary. Contrary. Billion, billion, about a billion, four billion, four billion, a thousand or ten thousand times more, uh, more than half of more, more than it's hundreds of millions of more than more than fifteen million, more, 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 not less, more, more, even more, more things, and more than fifty more, but more than thousands of hundreds of millions of millions of more, more. When they just said more than a hundred more, 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 and you. You grow more than a hundred, grow more than everyone else, more than half, have more, 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 grow, growing growth team, growing more, about a billion, five billion to billion, billions of more, 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 a lot more, more will be more, gonna be a lot more, 85,000, about 200 to 225, getting more and more, more followers got more engagement, about a million, hundred thousand, but it's grown into more than a billion, gonna get more engagements, millions of more than 50 times as much, more, because when more, thousands of more, thousands of more, more than a million, growing, more than 10, more and more, two billion, more open, even more. More open, more, more, that the more are more 30 different, more, more than 100 million, almost 2 billion to 100 million of them, more than 50%, uh, more, a lot more, 1 billion, more, thousands of more, so you can a lot more, more, more than a million, thousands of, we may find more, but we can do more. We will more than double, we'll add more than 250, share more and more, more services to help more thousands of, some of the more, a hundred times or a thousand times bigger. Uh, than billions and billions of, with tens of millions of tens of millions as many as two million growing and improving quickly and we'll keep you updated with more soon and about millions of more to do and you can find more than more than two billion giving more uh, so we've definitely grown about a hundred billion times deserves more than growing in importance more experiences that we'll have about 20,000 there are tens of thousands of more tens of thousands of a few more things more than 20 million more than 80 million grow and grow more of more and we've been more tens of thousands of more. We're more 20,000 more. More focused on more thousands of more and more and more. A lot more. A lot more. Still more steps give you more. A lot more. A lot more like feeling more. 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 One and a half billion more deeply. More. Two and a half billion feel more. More. By 50 million. More than two billion. Of more than two billion. More. 80 million. Four and a half million. Many more. It's going to go more and more. More. Just even more. Two and a half billion. So more, more, more. Got to imagine 10 times that much. When the pandemic arrived in 2020, I, like <laughs> many others, found myself glued to my phone more than ever, engaging in an activity that became commonly referred to as doom scrolling. But in those early days of the pandemic, doom scrolling wasn't just a natural reaction to the news of the day. It was the result of a perfect yet evil marriage between so many of us stuck online social media interfaces designed to game and hold our attention, and the realities of an existential global crisis. And while it may be hard to look away from bad news in any format, it's nearly impossible to do that when that news is endlessly presented via social media interfaces that know just what to show us next to keep us engaged. Now let me to make this work that I call the endless doom scroller. 
It's a website, you can see it at endlessdoomscrawler.com or at Oxioma, um, that presents a never-ending stream of doom, but without all the specifics. Its interface mimics the feed style of social media platforms, and its headlines are abstracted versions of real ones. And you can scroll for, scroll for as long or as fast as you like, but no matter how much you do so, you'll never get to the end. They just keep coming. It's a reductive interface that distills social media sites down to their barest, most generalized messages and interface conventions. It shows us what's behind our scroll-induced anxiety, interfaces and corporations that always want more. More doom leads to more time on site, leads to us giving more personal data, which leads to more profit. And so the Endless Doom Scroller offers up an opportunity for mindfulness, perhaps, about how we're spending our time online and about who most benefits from our late night scroll sessions. Using it might even enable a sort of exposure or substitution therapy, a way to escape or replace what these interfaces want from and do to us. In other words, perhaps the only way out of too much doom scrolling is endless doom scrolling. So I want to talk about three more works, um, all of which were commissioned for last fall's uh, Software for Less at Arbyte, um, and which are also in the show here. And the first of these grew out of an observation of mine, and one that I suspect many of you may have also had at some point in the recent past, uh, which is that social mo media notifications are getting a bit crazy. Um, they're more numerous, they're more noisy, they're less relevant. Um, and of course, one reason for this is that social media corporations are always tweaking their tactics, always trying new things, always looking for whatever change might increase engagement. And so I decided to start capturing um, all of the notifications I was seeing across my social media interfaces for a while. Uh, and I ended up doing this over a course of many months uh, until it became the basis for a work that I call Platform Sweet Talk. What I did is I took all those notifications and I depersonalized them. I ended up actually uh, focusing on Facebook in particular. But I took those notifications and I depersonalized, uh, depersonalized them, removing the bits that came from my data and replacing them with generic stand-ins like someone or somebody else. And this is because when we receive a notification that says, Yana's liked your photo, the keyword here is Yana's, right? It's like, oh. Right, maybe I'm interested in what Yana's liked, and so I'm going to go click on that. Um, or, uh, but they know that, well, if, if I didn't click on the one that was for Yana's, maybe they'll um, try Sonia, or maybe they'll try, try Marcela. Like, they'll, they'll keep, they keep trying, right? And they want to see which, which pieces of your data that they plug into their notifications are going to be the most effective to get you to click and to stay. And so once I had collected these, and over the course of a few months, I found that Facebook had hundreds of different notification sentences that they have composed, all these different variations. And I know I didn't get them all. Um, I decided to make an interface to present these now depersonalized notifications as a form of reduction that allows us to look at them without the hooks, to see just how Silicon Valley uses this tactic to seduce us into a one-sided relationship where we do all the work. Uh, to make visible how these messages are intentionally crafted to keep us scrolling, liking, and posting. So they're all aimed at, at wooing us into maximal platform engagement. And so speaking of maximal and Facebook, um, for the next work, I decided to revisit that same archive that I used for the Mark Zuckerberg supercut I showed you called Order of Magnitude. Um, only this time, instead of searching for every time he had talked about more and grow and numbers, I wondered, does Mark Zuckerberg ever talk about less? And so I set about searching the same archive, looking for any time he had. 
spoken about less, and I took it and I compiled it into another supercut. And now my, in, my intuition, um, and perhaps yours, um, and my recollection uh, was that it wouldn't add up to 47 minutes, right? Um, but I was still surprised to find uh, just how little it occurs. Because when I added up all of the less he spoke about from age 19 to age 34, over 15 years, it took less than 60 seconds mm -hmm. to play it. And while that tiny bit of less certainly reinforces the theme of, of the previous film, um, it also made me wonder, what might the world look like if Mark had thought about less as much as he'd thought about more? And so I used this raw material to create a new film that I called Deficit of Less, where I set out to reanimate the CEO into an alternate reality, expanding his less to be just as long as his more, taking those few bits of video and slowing them down to nearly 50 times their original length. So I'll show you, again, it's a 47 minute film, so I'm not gonna show the whole thing. You can come to Oxioma and watch it there, but uh, I'll give you a little bit. How might the world be different if Mark had been this inert? Where would we be as a society and a planet if he hadn't been so focused on growth and engagement to make the world more open and connected? What if Facebook had been engineered to give its users time rather than take it? Or more specifically, what if a social network wasn't always growing? What if it limited your ability to use it? Or what if it tried to slow you down rather than speed you up? In other words, what if a social network wanted less instead of more? And this question is what led me to create the final work I wanna talk about today. It's called Minus. 
It's a finite social network where you get 100 posts for life, where every time you submit to the feed, it subtracts from your lifetime total. And then when you reach zero posts left, that's it. No exceptions. The feed is reverse chronological, not algorithmic. Uh, post timestamps are vague. Nothing is monetized. There are no likes or follows or noisy notifications. And the site's only visible metric counts down, showing how many posts each user has remaining. And so just like life, Minus has limits. It doesn't pretend, like Big Social does, that everything, including our time and attention, is infinite. And part of what I wanted to know with Minus is how disorienting would it be to interact on a platform that doesn't try to induce endless engagement from your every waking second? What might users say or make when freed from infinite demand? And while it's still pretty early days for a small social network, the results I think are intriguing so far. Minus posts are often playful and poetic, sometimes funny, oftentimes strangely genuine or surprisingly genuine, I should say, sometimes sad. Um, I thought we could look at a few to get a bit of a feel for it. And so first is that uh, a number of things that people post about are self-reflective on this topic of the 100. Often come in, a lot of people come in thinking 100 is so small, shouldn't it be 1,000 or um, like, and then the, within, once they you post two or three, they start to realize actually 100 it's more than I thought. Um, so pretty quickly it comes to be larger than they expected. Uh, sometimes they are emotionally self-reflective. Sometimes they're vaguely therapeutic. Sometimes they're intensely self-reflective or revealing. Sometimes they're playful. This was a series of posts that played out over time where slowly little bits of it were being revealed. Some people use them to facilitate temporal projects, uh, say a series of, of poetry uh, posts. Sometimes they're vaguely analytical. Sometimes they're intensely analytical. Um, a lot of posts on Minus are multilingual, so the feed doesn't, isn't, um, isn't international, you know, it isn't localized for you. Um, whatever language people post on Minus is a language that appears on the feed. Um, sometimes people are frustrated by that. They wonder how to get rid of all this other language that isn't their language. Um, and it, I guess it's surprising to them that there's a lot of information out there that isn't, say, in English, um, uh, so uh, there's there's a there's a culture now where where people just translate the the posts that are there through Google Translate or whatever, um, and either translate their response back or write their response in their own language and ask you know and then people just translate them for themselves. Um, it's been inspirational for a variety of projects. Um, this uh, uh, Roy Vorgen has been doing a long-term project on Wittgenstein's 100 aphorisms, so this seemed like a perfect opportunity to him. Uh, to include Minus uh, in that project. Sometimes they're comical, quite comical. Um, the structure uh, of the post sometimes is really guided by the platform. And in fact, uh, um, adopting the term speed run uh, from gaming, from video gaming, sometimes people uh, perform what the community has come to refer to as speed runs, which is burning out the 100 posts as quickly as possible. 
Um, and so sometimes those are not that exciting, like 100 bottles of beer on the wall, 99 bottles of beer on the wall. But in this case, Elon Musk or someone, I don't know if it's the real Elon Musk, probably not, um, uh, had a quite tour de force uh, hour and a half of writing uh, 100 posts over uh, from a kind of a, I don't know, a self-reflective point of view, I guess. And so in a world where online culture and offline landscape both wither from our collective addiction to more, Minus is showing what can happen when the spaces we inhabit are designed for less. Thanks.